You have been perfectly still for hours with the ghosts spiralling away deep inside your mind. The dark and delicate spirits first awakened you many years ago. The spiralling ghosts move to and fro like a pendulum marking every memory of your life. You feel them spiral their thin webs of light deep inside you. Your hands have so often stretched out to break the thin webs in the darkness of your room. You feel another chill, another ghost. At intervals, voices call out to you. You have always understood that your destiny lies within the many dark spirals and shadows. You get out of bed and go to the window to peer out at the eerie shadows which still haunt you. The rain rolls down in curious twisting patterns on the pane of glass. You can see the silhouette of the mountains between the houses across the street. All seems peaceful outside but for the patter of raindrops. Your brief night vigil is just enough to coax your active mind to rest a while. Drip, drop, off you go to bed and the world of sleep. Drip, drop into the outstretched hand with a splash. You hear a bolt of lightning across your mind and the rumble of distant thunder in your ears. You are in the rain and wet once again. The wind carries the echo of your shoes on the pier out to the sea. The surface of the pier is uneven and your shoes splash into the shallow pools of water. The coldness and darkness of your childhood memory surround you. It is far too cold and wet a night to be out on the pier, yet you still left the house to be there. You hear the ghosts spin their spiralling webs of light. Listen, you hear a horn far out to sea. You walk to the end of the pier, past the many boats, huddled closely together in the harbour. The wind carries the sound of their rattling, rigging across the bay. At times, the sound of the rigging seems like a part of a musical. At other times, like the chains of a wandering ghost. The small lights of the town flicker away behind you. The wind picks up and roars out at all who dare to walk the pier on such a night. This winter reaper wraps your dress tightly around your body. You feel another chill another ghost around you. You see the vision of your father beside you on the pier. His back is turned towards you. You struggle to remember the bond of so many years. You do remember the simple journeys with your father through the hills nearby. They have become a distant memory. Another spiralling ghost in your mind, caught in its own tangled web of light. 
the last memory you have of him has stayed faithfully with you all through the years since his death. The evening of your 19th birthday was not unlike this evening. You spent some of it with him on the pier. There was the same chill in the air and the same distant rumble in the sky. You were standing at the end of the pier. Your father stood behind you with his arms wrapped around your waist. Listen. You hear a rumble in the distance. Look out. Ooze out and away. One how. Somehow. The last faithful farewell. The old and the new together. Another sudden chill grips your body. A flash of blue light from the violent sky lights up your room for a second or two. You lift your eyes to grasp the shadows before you. The veil and the rain of winter falls upon you so that you might feel like a princess crown queen in a hellish kingdom. Soon you are on your feet. The king who damned his three daughters stands before you. These three daughters' lives pass before your eyes like the lines of a school book from your childhood. The words, half muddled, run a lifeline out to you in the darkness. You turn quickly and flee to your bed before the rest of the tale can capture you. The ghosts follow you. You drift with them into that spiralling web of light. You drift with your hands outstretched, not knowing whether you are struggling to be free of the ghosts or be with them. You have the constant fear that you may drift and fall forever with them into the spiralling web of light. Never to escape. So often you have tried to move toward the light, but it has tricked and blinded you into ancient horrors of a mythical past. You know the moment of entry well, your lungs shudder rapidly for air, then with a quick flash of blinding light you see the full horror unfold before your eyes. A dwarf with piercing blue eyes, dressed in a circus master's red suit. He kicks and rolls about on the ground with curious jerking movements. A lion appears and begins to savagely maul the body. The dwarf's legs kick wildly about in the ov his oversized black boots. You hear the sound of young children joyfully laughing. And through the darkness, you can just make out their gleeful chubby faces. The lion grips the dwarf's body tightly in his great jaws and drags it off to the remote hills. You remember the day when you found this decaying little body by the bank of a stream with your father. On the way back home, you asked your daddy why the poor thing died. He did not answer your question, but instead grumbled about the bad weather that morning. The rain had you both before reaching the house. A cold evening you had of it. The wind blew in fiercely from the northeast. The whole day was gripped in the depths of despair of a midwinter freeze. 
There was no one else on the pier when you arrived. The wind blew the icy rain in from the sea. It was a little after midnight at the last glance of your watch. You had not come to the pier alone, but there was not a word between either of you for almost a whole hour. His hands were clasped tightly around your waist. But of you stood closely by the old lighthouse. He stood behind you, with his chin resting on your right shoulder. You tried to break the long silence with a few words about the movement and sound of the water below. But there were no words to describe such a beautiful thing. There was no need for words to be spoken between two so close. You felt him tighten his grip around your waist. You paused a few moments, then slowly pushed his clasped hands down below your hips to ease his firm grip on you. You hoped he did not notice your uneasiness. He turned his head in towards you and brushed his face against yours. A boat horn sounded in the harbour. The sound was sudden enough to startle you. You breathed in the cool, chill air of the night and closed your eyes. Then, there was only the wind and the ever-present spiralling ghosts inside you. His hand unclasped your waist, slipped under the hem of your dress and gripped your bare hips. You shared a few brief words for the first time in a long while. A ghost? Yes. Perhaps. He pulled your underwear down for you to step out of. You grasped the steel handrail of the pier with one hand. You leaned over and lifted your dress above your waist with the other hand. He slipped his hand under you patted your lips and guided himself inside. He gripped inside your hips tightly, with you moving in gentle circles for him. You thought about the spiralling ghosts in the web of light and that poor little dwarf. The dwarf's rib cage was half submerged in a stream in the hills. On the journey home with your father, you felt each dying breath of the dwarf. He continued to move frantically inside you. Finally, without issue, he slipped out. You could do nothing but turn and embrace him. Listen, the wind has died, the rain continues to wrap against your window, the faint shapes and shadows of the night still remain with you, the ghosts continue to spiral downward, spinning their webs of light in the dark recesses of your mind. You follow the ghosts into that damp and dark abyss which you have known so well. You remember the tale your father once told you in the dead of night while sitting on the edge of your bed. It was also a stormy night when the sky flashed with blue lightning and rumbled uneasily. There was only the sound of the rain on your window and the occasional boat home from the coast. The tale was about the old lighthouse on the pier and its keeper, Old Book. The light shone out across the sea to guide boats homeward on many a treacherous winter night. So often, Old Book could be seen each evening walking out along the pier to his lighthouse to begin work. In the early hours of one morning, when the waves still crashed over the pier, he was dragged down into the depths of the sea while standing at the doorway of his lighthouse. 
Days later, his body was found in a half-sunken fishing boat in the harbour. This boat was damaged on the very same night old book was dragged below. The lighthouse has stood empty and unmanned ever since. Your father was always up quickly at the end of the tale, leaving you in the darkness of your room. You never understood how your mother coped with his coldness and remoteness, and his dabbling in the occult. He never removed his necklace of tiny stone crosses and a single carved lion head. When he recounted his tales to you at night, he would constantly fiddle with the necklace. He also told you of mysterious voices he heard of long dead men and women who lived in the German Black Forest region. He often spoke to you about a miller's son who had died of the White Plague long before the Great War. The last voice he ever spoke about before his death was the Feldhor 2383, whom he had talked with at great length. She had met her end in bloody February snows at the hands of an evil empire. Even though you never heard the voices your father spoke about, you felt you knew them intimately. You do not believe your home has echoed to the voices since your father's death. Listen, a voice emanates from a thin web of light in the darkness. It is a voice from the past. Look, a spiralling ghost emerges from the thin web of light. Look, closer still, you see a face, your own face. Your hair is tangled and your bare body is smudged with dirt. You cover your breasts with your folded arms. There is a scorch mark just above your breasts. Feldhor 666. You hear the voice of your father reading aloud the words and number on your scorch mark over and over again. He reads it in the same tone as he did when he taught you German verse in your childhood. An old white-haired woman puts a blanket around you and leads you away. The image of you disappears from the thin web of light. Your father's words still echo in your head. Each movement you see in the thin web of light is speeded up like an old cinematic film from the old days of silence and romance. You drift into this spiralling web of light with an uncontrollable falling feeling. There is no chance of escape which consciousness might bring. Like all dreams and passages of the night, you do not remember all that you see and hear. There is a dead zone in this place which you have no recollection of. You only know that the zone is there and that you must avoid it at all costs. You know it's open. It's marked where the pendulum stops its swing to and fro with great arcs. The weighted end of the pendulum holds a gold Roman shield with an indistinct crest. The shaft stretches far above your field of vision into the darkness. There is a suggestion of sound when you watch it swing freely, like the lapping waters on the seashore seen through a closed window. The rain continues to wrap upon your bedroom window, but the sky is a little less violent in the early hours of the morning. The distant rumbling in the sky reminds you of a stirring in your past, a great feast after the winter solstice. On the night of the great feast, a violent night like tonight, 
he remarked that the sky was not a place to seek enlightenment. Were you not in such a deep, deep sleep the ticking of the old grandfather clock downstairs would have awoken you, and you would have crept silently down to sit beneath it. You would sit there until the sound filled your ears and finally swallowed you whole. There you would remain, waiting for the arrival of the haunting reverie of the morning. Close your eyes and listen to the drops on your window. You will never free from these days of childhood as long as you live. Listen. The earth breathes outside your window. Listen to the sigh of the oncoming morning. Look into the spiralling web of light. See the ghosts spin in time with the swing of the pendulum. Look. It could be you between the sunset and sunrise. It could be you between the sunrise and sunset. Look now. You can see the first light of a new season. The pendulum stops. There, before you, in the first light of dawn, is the zone you have always feared. You can see a clear opening where the spiralling web of light comes to a point. The light strikes a circular plate of silver with a haze rising above it. You can clearly make out images passing across the plate. It has a surface like glass. It is not the opening you first thought it was. Yet, you know your father somehow passed through this plate. You see his face on its surface. It is a softer and easier face than the one you are so familiar with. His face is warm and rich with character. He makes no sign or gesture to you. It is as if you were one, the one dead. You feel the chill from another world. The image of your father vanishes without trace and the plate of silver light darkens until it is no more. You had a troubled night. You tossed and turned in your bed until early morning. You rose shortly after dawn and went down to the cold, dimly lit kitchen. The stone floor was harsh on your bare feet. You sat and watched the day arrive before dressing yourself. It was just after eight and you listened for your mother upstairs. She was still in bed and her early morning thoughts. Outside, the old well was overflowing with rain. You watched the water flow down the cracked stonework for a while. Finally, you felt alive, set out for the day in the direction of the harbour. The storm during the night passed and the sky settled itself quietly above you. The morning passed, slowly recovering its colour. You had an urge to leave the sea far below you and move closer to the heavens once you reached the harbour. You walked up the slippery gravel path into the hills. All around you, the grass whispered in the wind and the landscape glowed. You remembered that a stream flowed down the hillside where you walked the previous winter. Another would flow again that year. The stones embedded in the path would wear away a little more and then summer would come. Though the hills remained empty of walkers that day, you still saw the ghost of a young girl running in the gorse and brambles of summer. The spines cut and scratched the legs of the girl. The days passed by for you. 
You now had time to capture and admire the things which slipped easily by as a child in the hills. You remember the sundial on a small glass plateau below the climbing gravel path. It was made of marble and sunk into a concrete foundation. The metal dial was long tarnished and the engraved Roman numerals were quite faint. The noon bell rang out on that pagan day of the sun. Its light was only strong enough for you to see your father dance and turn crosses to the fiddler's tunes. You spent all day resurrecting the old ghost of your father. The little dwarf was the only spectre of you. The others were figments of your father's world which you came to fear during your childhood. You found no warmth in the day, no absolution. The gravel path wound its way through the hills, narrowing and winding at intervals. There was no smell carried in the wind from the local town below. You could just smell the sea and the damp countryside around you. You saw sheep for the first time that day on the hillside in the distance near an old boat yard. You never walked that far with your father when you were young. On your way back towards town, you passed an old man and woman on their way to midday service in the local church. Though you did not know them by name, You'd passed them many times close to the church. The old man was confined to a wheelchair, and you knew he was a patient in the nursery. <coughs> the woman was almost pushing the wheelchair when you came upon them. On that day, she was caught up in conversation with her companion and occasionally pointed to the sky. She did not greet you with a usual nod of her head, as they both passed. She had a slightly tanned Mediterranean complexion. You knew the old man was from the town itself. You looked to where she was pointing in the sky and saw an old biplane with military markings fly past. There was an airfield not far away where it must have been travelling to. You had a troubled day wandering aimlessly through the streets of the town. Your head was full of some of the strangest thoughts you ever had. You remembered many people from your past, all the places you had been. It was a past which controlled and made you its silver opening to another world. Your father had spoken so much about this other world when he was at the height of his practice. You had often gone downstairs at the dead of night to find him seated in his armchair in the living room. At intervals, he would burst into streams of German dialect, which you could not understand, though you were quite proficient in the language. Sometimes, you had made out the name Heinrich. Years later, your father described Heinrich as a soldier of the Great War who fought and died with great honour for his country and leader. You also recalled your father once saying that the old fighting blood was surely in you when you managed a particular difficult climb in the hills on a snowy February morning. Your mother had warned your father not to take you out on severe mornings. Your father would often leave the house with you grumbling about all her wailing and raging. You passed your father's old surgery on the main street in the town. There was a young doctor practicing there now. You knew him only to see on his calls in the town. He took over the local surgery after your father died. People said the place was kept far cleaner and better run when the young doctor moved there. He lived in a two-storey bedroom flat above the surgery where your father had sometimes stayed if he worked very late into the night. 
there was much talk of the new doctor spending too much time at the races in the city. He liked the feel of money and the sound of happy banter far too much. Your father once gave you the opportunity to work as a secretary in the surgery, but you could not stand the sickness and the smells there. The place too finally got to him. It was during the summer when the bouts of heavy coughing and chest pains began. He would pause at every resting point in the hills when you walked with him. You could not understand why he bothered at all. It was too late for fresh air to help him anymore. He gave up the walks and confined himself. In bed, he would say he wouldn't make it past bell time. He was right. He went noisily in his sleep one night into the dead zone, the vanishing point of this world. How else could he have gone? It was late afternoon and the light of the day began to fade. You paid your casual visit to the tavern in the town. The tavern had just opened and it was empty but for a local fisherman and his wife who sat on two small stools beside the great open fireplace. The fire warmed and you sat some feet away from it. The embers of the great fire burned and cracked and the voices of the fisherman and his wife mesmerised you. Looking deeply into that fire, you thought again about the spiralling ghosts inside you and how a stranger's face in the day can become a horrible vision of the night. It had to be the reaper's revenge in you. You never seemed able to be free of the pervading sense of evil in the air. It must have been all the talk and planning many years ago about the war hospital and cemetery, both of which were never built. The stone towers and foundations still stood to attention, with a roaring sea not far below them, the shadowing watching over the town. You sat in the tavern drinking for hours until the fire finally dwindled, and you went on your way. The night swallowed the day and the glisten of the street lights and the moonlight on the wet roads guided you home. It was too cold to pause and walk along the pier on your journey. The flashing lighthouse beacon flickered away and the boat horn sounded. You stopped for a moment to look back at the pier one last time that day. You spent so many days of miracle and rust with God as your witness out on the pier. You fought so many wars of illusion in your childhood. You remember the fires which burned inside you, the frustrations and struggles to be yourself at home with your father. And yet, all the time, you would need it, just milk and rapture. You remembered all the nights you awoke and tried to make sense of the patterns in your mind. All those dark days you saw nothing, the skies led heavy with rain, were mystic to find you. You felt like a stranger in your own town, your father's town, trying to follow in the footsteps, but never in the evil ways. You arrived shortly before supper. Your mother did not inquire about your whereabouts all day. She was used to your father being away long hours at his practice and she became slowly more emotionally isolated. She was a religious woman of few words. She made the supper in silence. You took a cup of tea up with you to your bedroom. You paused for a moment to glance at the photographs and paintings hung on the wall. They were all landscapes. Not a single one featured a member of your family. Your father was fond of the landscapes. He painted a little himself in the hills above the harbour. You hear the low bell notes of the grandfather clock chime eleven. You lost track of time after that. And vaguely remembered hearing the sound of your mother retiring to bed. Her room was a world away from yours. 
In the darkness of your room, there was no longer a thin web of light. It dissipated above and beyond your view. The pendulum was still there, though not as you had left it the night before. It hung motionless, without a hint of sound. There was a shape below the pendulum. You made out a human form. You recognised the glint of the silver buttons on the dwarf's red circus master's suit. His body hung by a rope from the gold shield at the bottom of the pendulum. You also saw the line to the right of the dwarf's body. He paused and walked around the body hanging above him, stopped and moved his head as if he sensed danger in the near vicinity. The lion seized the leg of the dwarf in his mouth and tugged violently. The pendulum began to swing again back and forth in great arcs. The movement of the pendulum with the body of the dwarf hung from it mesmerized you. The pendulum is gone. They came during the night when you were asleep. There were two of them. An old grey-haired man and a younger man. They moved with urgency, cut the dwarf's body down and wrapped him in a blanket. The large red boots of the dwarf struck out at the end of the rolled-up blanket they placed him in. There seemed no end to these boots. What became of these boots? What became of the dwarf? They floated him down a river. His body quickly sunk. You felt a great loss in your heart when you discovered the dwarf was gone. The two night prowlers went quietly. You saw the pendulum in a later dream that morning. It lay horizontal on the ground. A rope was still tied around its weighted end. The other end of the rope was coiled up next to the shaft of the pendulum. The darkness closed around you. There was a time when the great pendulum swung and you thought you saw your reflection on the surface of the shield. The grandfather. The clock. It struck the hours downstairs. There was a break in the heavy clouds the next morning. The old marble sundial was never more than a minute or two wrong. It was just after eight. You saw that the lifeboat was not moored in the harbour from your window. It had been out at sea since dawn. The fishermen sat in the tavern in the town at lunchtime and talked about the dangers of their lot. Old Captain Siver, who lives in the nursery, passed away during the night. Some of the children of the town went to a local air show. Others went to the circus in the evening. You decided, when he rose from bed, not to walk along the pier, no walk in the hills above the harbour. When he went downstairs, you stopped by the grandfather clock. Your father always wound the clock every night before retiring to bed. He never missed a single night. He never once stopped ticking from the first day he bought it to the day he died. The long pendulum hung motionless. Your eyes followed the long shaft upwards. Your faces meet. Twenty minutes past seven. You thought it was a strange time to stop. You grew used to that time as the days, weeks and months passed by. Your mother appeared in the hallway and witnessed the meeting of two faces. She beckoned to you to leave it be. 
You both went into the kitchen and from the window watched the first fall of winter snow. <laughs> 